Broadcasting from Cincinnati. You're listening to the Ringside Reporter Podcast. All the news from the world of boxing right here. Well, I'm talking to you the way I want to talk to you. Now, here's your host, Eric Lorda. Our guest at this time is Tom Loeffler. He is with K2 Promotions and promotes the middleweight champion of the world, Gennady Golovkin, Triple G, who is getting ready to fight Daniel Jacobs on March 18th in New York City at Madison Square Garden. Tom, welcome back to Ringside Reporter. Thanks, Eric. It's always uh, always good to be on the show, and uh, uh, just looking forward to a great a great weekend, uh, March 17th, uh, March 18th in uh, in New York. Absolutely, man. So, how are ticket sales for this event? Are, t- are tickets still available? Our tickets are available, although uh, they're going very strong. Um, they're outpacing uh, the last time Gennady fought in uh, Madison Square Garden against Lemieux, um, wow. and that was a sold out show. So, we're expecting uh, another sold out show by, oh, uh, by March 18th. Wow. Wow. And that card is stacked. I mean, that card is stacked. I mean, obviously, you got Triple G and Jacobs. You got Chocolatito versus Rung Visai for the his that's his mandatory. Quadras yeah. is on the card. Ryan Martin, Andy Lee, they're all on the card. I mean, just a uh, kind of like a who's who. I mean, you guys really stack it when you put Triple G on the card. Well, we try to uh, provide uh, you know just the value for the fans, um, and and there's a little bit of every everything on this show. It's it's clearly the two best middleweights uh, fighting each other. Um, they're both. Uh, uh, you know, great ambassadors from the sport, both uh, Gennady Golovkin and Danny Jacobs. Um, you know, two of the nicest guys you'll meet uh, in the sport of boxing. And at the same time, when they get in the ring, they're both uh, two of the biggest punchers, both over 90% knockout ratios. Um, so that's a, a, a tremendous main event. But then, uh, as you mentioned, we got Chocolatito, who many people have as the number one pound for pound fighter against uh, Rung Visai, who uh, is a big puncher from Thailand, is mandatory, and uh, Carlos Quadras, who uh, you know just lost a close decision to uh, Chocolatito, he's fighting uh, David Carmona. That's a, that's another battle of the super flyweight division. Uh, Ryan Martin, one of the the, the top prospects are coming up. Uh, his nickname is Blue Chip because he's uh, you know has so much skill and and uh, potential against uh, local uh, Pee Wee Cruz from uh, Port Chester, New York. So. It's really good, and uh, it also, uh, like you said, Andy Lee. Andy Lee's 3-0 and with three knockouts at, uh, at MSG, so uh, uh, it'll be his first fight back in uh, just over a year, and uh, he's fighting actually one of uh, Gennady's, just coincidentally, uh, it turns out to be one of uh, Gennady's sparring partners, uh, Keandre Leatherwood, but uh, Keandre is with the uh, uh, Deontay Wilder uh, group that there in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, cha- uh, trained by Jay Diaz, um, yeah. so he's coming. He's coming to win, so it's uh, yeah, it's got a little bit of everything for uh, for the fans that night. Wow, Triple G uh, posted a uh, I, think, I don't know if it was on Instagram or Twitter, but I saw him. It's a picture of him and his sparring partners for this fight yep. coming up, and I don't know if those are his regular sparring partners or he just brought these guys in special. They look like monsters next to him. I mean, they're <laughs> they're huge. I was like, my God! I looked at him and I looked. At, it's like he's surrounded by giants, man. These yeah. guys are well, huge. I can't know, believe he gets in the kinda, ring with these guys. Yeah, well, he's you know he's kind of short uh, in stature, uh, you know, as far as uh, the middleweight is concerned. He's uh, uh, Danny is two inches taller than him. He's got a longer reach, um, but he spars with bigger guys. Usually spars with 168, 175 pounders, and um, um, you know, you know, Abel always uh, picks guys that uh, that uh, you know he feels would be effective for um, any particular uh, upcoming fight, and uh, all the guys that. Uh, he has in camp right now are, are real quality guys. Uh, Julius Jackson um, has been there a number of times with uh, with uh, Gennady sparring. John Jackson, who actually was, uh, I think, uh, Andy Lee's last win at the Garden. Uh, he was putting on a great fight, and then uh, he got caught by a famous uh, right hook that Andy has. Um, he's up there. Um, uh, David Benavides, who's a young guy, 168 pounder, super strong. He's uh, Giving him great work, and then, like I mentioned, to Keandre Leatherwood. So, it's uh, they're very happy with the sparring. Uh, Gennady always pushes himself, uh, train as hard as he can. At the same time, you know he he really uh, appreciates uh, his uh, sparring partners and and uh, you know the fact that they are an integral part of helping him get ready. So he he definitely they always treat everyone with respect in the camp, and, and it's just a great atmosphere up there in, in the Big Bear at uh, Abel's gym. Awesome. 
Do you think it's fair to say that this is probably the biggest fight in Triple G's career so far? I would say so. I would say not only the biggest fight, but the most dangerous fight. Um, you know, when, when Danny Jacobs uh, can blow out uh, an undefeated uh, Peter Quillen, uh, former world champion, um, you know, in one round, uh, there's no question that uh, he brings a lot of danger and uh, punching power with him. And, you know, I think the uh, reception that we've got, I mean, his last fight when Gennady went to uh, to London at the O2, um, and the tickets sold out there very quickly. It was like, uh, I think Eddie you know, was saying 11 minutes. Uh, it, that was a, a huge fight for Europe, especially in the U.K., but I think on the overall uh, scale, this this uh, fight has a bigger uh, feel to it only because, uh, you know, Danny is perceived as, as such a big threat to uh, Gennady. If anyone's going to beat Gennady, uh, you know, Danny has the best chance of, of doing that. And then uh, you know, just the rest of the show, it just feels like, uh, you know, it's a big event and uh, no better place to hold it than, than the Mecca of Boxing at, uh, at at MSG. Absolutely. And, you know, you, well, you we mentioned the, the uh, Jacobs-Quillen fight, and I know you saw that. Were you shocked that that fight went one round, I mean, that it ended that quickly and Jacobs took him out like that? I was surprised. Um, I, I I felt uh, Jacobs had the edge on, on, that, on that fight, but... Uh, you know, uh, Peter Quillen was undefeated, um, and, and I think uh, actually uh, he was the betting favorite. If uh, if I remember correctly, uh, whatever the odds makers were, actually had uh, had Quillen as the uh, as the favorite. So I think Danny had something to prove, and and um, you know that's one of those things where he caught him early, and then he uh, jumped on top of him and and was able to uh, get the referee to stop the fight. And I think that could be a similar pattern for this fight. I mean, both. Uh, Triple G and, and Danny Jacobs are such big punchers. I think whoever lands the first big punch, you know, definitely uh, will sway the momentum uh, to their side. And that's why I think the fans are reacting to it. This could go one round. It could go, you know, eight or ten rounds. I don't think it will go 12 rounds, but uh, it, uh, it definitely uh, this is going to be one of those that you don't want to you don't want to blink uh, from the first bell just to see what uh, what the fireworks that both guys uh, bring with them. Well, what is his knockout streak now? What is it, 19? Or what is it, the knockout streak uh, that Golovkin has? Is, uh, I thought it was 23. Is it 23? Yeah, oh, yeah uh-huh. that, that's correct. Uh, Gennady has 23 knockouts in a row, and, and Danny Jacobs has 12 knockouts in a row. He's uh, had 12 wins since the Pirog uh, set back, and uh, all by knockout, so... You know, between the two, 35 KOs in a row is uh, yeah. a pretty impressive uh, KO streak. Man. Let me ask you this. Like, at times in the ring, it almost looks like Triple G lets his opponents hit him flush, almost to see what kind of power they have. I mean, I saw him do that with Kell Brook. I saw him do that with, uh, uh, who was the other guy he fought? Willie Monroe Jr. I saw him do him with that, too. And is this purposeful? I mean, why does he do it? Because it, it almost looks like he drops his guard and invites him to, to hit him. What I mean is that what he's doing, or is that just uh, are they just getting flush shot? I mean, what happens? You know, I don't think uh, Gennady is careless in the ring. Um, I, I do think that he tries to provide some excitement and entertainment for the crowd, <laughs> um, and sometimes uh, you know, getting getting uh, the fighters to open up on him allows uh, an opening for him then to uh, to counter them. And uh, um, I think, uh, you know, I mean, he didn't do that, like with Curtis Stevens, for example, or David Lemieux, right. you know, very two big uh, punchers uh, who actually, in fact, uh, are fighting each other the week before this fight. Uh, now that I mention it, it's, uh, that's March 11th. on. That's on an HBO, amazing but, fight, uh, too, yeah. I think Gennady has such a, such a high ring IQ that he, he can kind of gauge the danger factor of, uh, of uh, you know, not, I wouldn't say he allows someone to hit him because that, that's kind of reckless, but I, yeah. I think... Uh, to get someone to to take a a chance and uh, and throw a punch and then uh, you know he can counter them. I mean with Kell Brook, you know a lot of people for whatever reason thought that uh, you know Gennady was slipping because uh, Kell was able to hit him. I mean you can't take can't take anything away from Kell Brook. He's super fast. He he was an undefeated middle uh, welterweight champion. Um, you know probably one of the best uh, welterweights out there right now, beating uh, Sean Porter, who, who I'm always very impressed with every time Sean goes in the ring. So. Um, you know, when you have a welterweight with the fast hands, uh, even if he was fighting at a at a higher weight, he still had uh, you know very quick, very agile moves in the ring. And um, you know, uh, I think the bottom line is if if Gennady or when Gennady hit him and, and he fractured his orbital bone, I think the referee did a, 
or actually not the referee, but the corner, made a very wise decision by uh, stopping that fight because Kel showed a lot of heart, and he wasn't going to back down. He was going to stand toe to toe there with uh, with Gennady, and that's just, you know, once uh, you have someone in that position, it, it just doesn't make sense uh, to to risk uh, you know future fights against a big puncher like Triple G. Yeah, I said it when that fight happened. I mean, his corner may have extended his career by what they did because you know you, you could see that he wasn't going down and he wasn't. Uh, he was going to stand in front of him, but he was just taking shots. I mean, did did Kel ever hurt him in that fight? I mean, I know he hit him clean, but uh, it doesn't. It didn't look to me like he ever hurt him. No, he, he definitely hit him clean a couple times, um, but uh, you know, I don't think Gennady's ever been hurt. I mean, he said, you know, a lot of the interviews we've just done for this fight, um, he's never been hurt, even in the amateurs. You know, and, uh, oh. and Gennady's one of those rare guys that. You know, he, as successful of an amateur career that he had, he had a lot of knockouts in the amateurs. I mean, he had a famous knockout stoppage over uh, Lucien Boutet, who was an outstanding uh, amateur, and uh, he's kind of carried his power through. Naturally, with, uh, you know, the teaching of uh, Abel and, and uh, really refining his uh, professional style, he's, uh, you know, increased the pressure and just uh, the effectiveness uh you know, uh, that he has in the ring now. But, uh, I mean, look, you know, Kel Brook now is fighting uh, another great fight against Errol Spence, and you never know if that fight would have gone a few more rounds. You never know what, what uh, could have happened. So we're always happy when, the, you know, the fighters are able to come out uh, safely. And uh, even though he had uh, an injury and, and needed a, uh, an operation on it, he's able to now, you know, come back and, and, uh, and defend his, uh, his welterweight title against his mandatory challenger, which is, which is going to be another great, uh, another great matchup. Definitely, definitely. Triple G, you know, when he fought David Lemieux, he fought a real good tactical battle. It wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't a search and destroy mission. You know, he used the jab, he used a lot of movement. He he looked about as good as above a boxer as you've ever seen. Is that the kind of, I mean, tactically, going into the uh, the Jacobs fight, is that the kind of fight you, you, we should expect against Jacobs? I mean, like a tactical fight like that? I think it's hard to predict, uh, um, you know, how the fight's going to go. It definitely depends on uh, how their styles match up. Um, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he fights a much more tactical fight because of Danny's uh, punching power, and, and I would imagine Danny is, is going to fight uh, somewhat of a cautious fight uh, as well, at least in the first few rounds, just to kind of you know get a feel uh, for it. But uh, again, if if they start opening up, it's going to be <laughs> guns blazing uh, in there. But uh, I would imagine it would be uh, it, uh, just uh, looking at it from from my point of view, I'd, I'd imagine it'd be a more, uh, more tactical fight, like like he fought against the Lemieux, where he really controlled. Uh, Lemieux, who, who is an extremely strong puncher, especially as a middleweight, um, he really controlled him with a jab. Now, now you know you could uh, arguably say uh, Danny is physically uh, much taller and, and bigger than uh, than Lemieux, so it'll be hard to do um, to to Danny Jacobs what uh, Gennady was able to do to Lemieux because I think uh, he was able to control him, you know, with his jab. But with Danny's hand speed and and his size and reach advantage. You know, I think that he's going to be a lot hard, uh, more hard pressed uh, to do that. So it's always interesting um, to see, you know, how the styles change or how they complement each other once they actually um, once they actually get in the ring. I agree, and this will be this is this is interesting because this is the second straight fight that Triple G has gone into somebody's backyard. Uh, you know, he went to uh, England to fight Kell Brook. He's going to New York to fight Danny Jacobs, who's uh, you know right in Brooklyn. And, uh, you know, do you ever worry about being on the wrong end of a decision, being in their hometown? You know, uh, Gennady's very comfortable um, fighting anywhere. Um, you know, a lot of uh, fighters, especially based in the U.S., well, I should say even, even European fighters, they uh, they, lo- they like to fight in a particular uh, city or, or just staying in, in, you know, in, in their own country. And, and Gennady is one of those guys, it's very rare that uh, he's, become such a marketable guy, but also is willing to travel. Um, that's what made the Kell Brook uh, matchup such an interesting thing for the U.K. fans because they're not used to one of the American stars or, or the stars over here in the U.S. coming to defend their titles uh, over uh, in the U.K. And uh, it's it's just a treat for the fans. And Monte Carlo, when he fought there, um, you know, it's just... Uh, uh, 
uh, you know, our, our strategy with Gennady is is really building him up on a worldwide uh, basis. Um, and, and the fact that he is so comfortable in the ring and so confident, you know, luckily we haven't had to worry about any bad decisions with 23 knockouts in a row. But, um, you know, this would be his fifth time fighting um, at uh, at the Garden. Actually, the, the sixth time in New York State where he made his, uh, actually his U.S. debut up in uh, upstate New York at the Turning Stone Casino on uh, on HBO against Proxa, but uh, you know we, we we have a lot of confidence in the uh, the New York Commission and and the sanctioning bodies, and and I think um, even though Danny is is from New York and and uh, has a big following and and is is very respected, you know, in the boxing community, I, I think uh, you know I look forward to having uh, you know neutral officials and and. Um, Again, I don't think uh, whichever way, whichever direction it goes, I don't think we're going to see the twelfth round in that fight anyway. Right. Yeah, I think that's the thing. I mean, I think the the one thing that really gets overlooked at Triple G, and, and you hear a lot of uh, you hear a lot of criticism of him about you know some of the people he fights and everything like that. But I mean, like you know, he can only fight who's put in front of him or who signs the contract. But that being said. You know, this is a guy who goes to backyards. I mean, he goes to England to fight Kell Brook, goes to New York to fight Jacobs. I mean, he will go in somebody's backyard without hesitation, you know. And I think that's really the thing that gets overlooked. No, 100%. And, and uh, you know, Abel, we, we had the uh, uh, media day here in Los Angeles yesterday, um, and Abel really said it the best. Uh, you know, whoever wants to critique Gennady for – the fighters uh, that he's fought. I mean, you have to look at first. You have to look at the guys who have just flat out uh, refused to get in the ring uh, with him, and, and it's well documented. You know, it wasn't like uh, Kell Brook was his first choice, and he wanted to fight a welterweight uh, to go to England. I mean, we went through the whole Canelo situation, then he wanted to unify with Billy Joe Saunders, who was who was the other only other champion that he doesn't have a title. Uh, from and then uh, you know the, the Eubank Jr. situation. So if you look at it, Kell Brook was was really the fourth the fourth choice, and to fight an undefeated welterweight who's considered you know one of the top guys, um, or, you know arguably the top guy in that division is uh, you know that that's that's not bad as 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 the fourth choice. But uh, what Abel pointed out yesterday is not necessarily who he's beating; it's how he's beating them. I mean, if you look at Gennady's record and uh who he's beaten it's uh you know he's beaten a lot of guys who've never been stopped ever in their career i mean you look at the way he stopped daniel Giel, uh you know getting hit flush in the face and then coming back throwing a punch almost at the same time and and knocking out Giel the way he did at the garden or you know martin murray's tough as nails uh murray dropped sergio martinez twice in uh in argentina he only got credit for one knockdown um you know lo- lost a close uh controversial decision down there, lost in Germany to Felix Sturm, and then Gennady able to uh, to beat him, um, give him his only loss, and, and to stop him. Same thing with uh, Willie Monroe, and, and I mean, the list goes on. David, uh, Dominic Wade, um, you know, the way he stopped uh, David Lemieux. I mean, he's just dominating, you know, world-class fighters. Macklin, Matthew Macklin was another... Uh, uh, world-class fighter who had had, had uh, given Sergio Martinez a lot of fits and uh, actually dropped Sergio uh, also at Madison Square Garden in the theater. And the way Gennady was able to take him out with that body shot, um, you know, where he, he broke one of his ribs. And uh, same thing with Curtis Stevens. I mean, he's just dominating these guys that are world-class fighters. And so, uh, you know, I think the blame really has to be on the other, you know, guys that, that don't agree to fight Gennady, and I think a big part of that is that knockout streak. When he's got 23 knockouts in a row, it's a pretty good chance that uh, if someone gets in the ring with them, they're going to get knocked out, and that's that's a lot. It gives people a lot more uh, hesitation than if they know they're going to get in the ring and just lose a 12-round decision and, and not really get hurt um, or get the potential of getting hurt in the fight, and that's where I think a lot of people... Uh, uh, hesitate when it, when it comes to fighting an eye. Uh, yeah, no doubt. I, I think that's a big part of it, man. I mean, when you know uh, when you know there's a good chance you're going to get stopped or hurt or something like that. Yeah, that you know stock goes up that you may not sign that contract. You know, I know Jacobs right now is the priority, but if he does get by Jacobs, there's a lot of rumors that he that uh, Billy Joe Saunders in June could be next. Is there any any truth to that or? You know, really, everyone's focused on uh, on Danny. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's 
you know, it's not great to speculate on, on future fights. I can say yeah. nothing is there's there's nothing signed. Uh, there's a lot of speculations with with Canelo, what's going to happen uh, with him in September, what's going to happen with uh, you know potentially you know uh, a Saunders fight. I, I I will say it's always been Gennady's dream, and and you know, it's not a secret. He's always said he wants to unify. Uh, the middleweight division and fight all the champions. It's just you can't do that if the champions don't want to fight you. They refuse to, to sign an agreement. And you know the the uh, amount of money that he's bringing with him. You know the excuse of it's too big of a risk and not enough reward uh, really has gone out the window a long time ago. I mean, you know this will be uh, Danny's uh, biggest uh, biggest payday of, of of his career. Kel Brook had his biggest payday. Dominic Wade, you know, got his biggest purse of his career. Uh, David Lemieux, same thing. Uh, William Monroe Jr., same thing. Martin Murray, the same thing. You know, he's bringing, you know, financial rewards to the middleweight division. So, um, you know, you can only fight the guys that actually agree to fight you, and that's why um, we have a, so much respect for uh, for Kel Brook, who who actually signed the exact same agreement that uh, Eddie Hearn was negotiating with uh, with Chris, Chris Eubank Jr. You know, it took him about a month to negotiate that, and and we literally in two days signed, changed the name from uh, Eubank Jr. to Kel Brook, and uh, Kel signed signed that same exact agreement, and uh, and we give Danny Jacobs a lot of credit uh, as well because people have actually uh, vac- <laughs> vacated their mandatory positions um, in order not to to fight uh, Gennady, but Danny is a, a true warrior. He's got a a strong fighting uh, spirit. I know he's supremely confident. In his abilities, and uh, Gennady admits this is a big challenge for him. This is this is the type of challenge that he's always been looking forward to. And the same thing with Abel. Abel wants to find out, you know, how good Gennady really is, because Abel said that we haven't seen the best uh, Gennady Golovkin in in the ring, and only until he gets pressed are we going to see, you know, how good he really is. And I think Danny Jacobs is the guy that's a real uh, danger uh, to Gennady. And and look, if the wrong thing happens. Uh, you know, for Gennady, if he's not 100% on on March 18th, um, you know, then Danny Jacobs is is a a uh, unified uh, middleweight champion at the top of the middleweight division. And and unlike other sports, the thing that's so intriguing about boxing is that uh, on one night, you know, the fortunes of two fighters can change uh, completely. And then uh, Danny Jacobs would be on top of uh, of the middleweight division and arguably at the, on the top of the sport of boxing because. When you have a story like Danny Jacobs, and if, if if he can beat a guy like Triple G, then all of a sudden he skyrockets uh, to the top of the sport. And and correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought I heard you say uh, in another interview that this is a winner-take-all match in the sense that there is no rematch clause. So if uh, if he gets beat, then you guys are going to have to go back to the drawing board and try to get a rematch, but there is no rematch clause there. Is that correct? That, that's true. It's a, it's a mandatory fight, and... Uh, and uh, the deal that I'd negotiated with with Al Heyman and and uh, Team Jacobs is uh, yeah, it, it it is a winner take all uh, situation. So it's uh, it's definitely a, a big risk uh, for Gennady. But again, this is what he responds to. And and uh, you know, going back to the other sports, you know, you can have a few losses or multiple losses, whether it's football or basketball or baseball, and still you know win the. Uh, win the world championship and uh, or if you have a bad week or you know you're not feeling good one week and you're injured and you want to you know sit uh, sit one week out you can and then you know come back the next week in boxing you can't do that if uh, you know when he fought Gabriel Rosado who's uh, you know who's a, a very tough uh, warrior uh, himself when he fought him um, in New York Gennady had the flu uh, and and two days before the fight it was like a 50-50 chance where we had to cancel the fight and then he went into that fight you know he was able to He's able to come out victorious, but those are the type of situations in boxing where you can't just say, you know, I, I don't feel good this day. You know, let's post- postpone the fight because everything, you know, whether the television networks, whether the arena, you know, all the marketing, everything is geared towards that one night, that one event. That uh, it's really hard to uh, postpone these things unless uh, unless one of the guys is just, uh, you know, just can't uh, can't get in the ring. Absolutely, Robert. Do you have any questions for Tom? Uh, wow. Uh, well, Tom, you've covered a lot of the area I was going to cover, but um, one one question I have is how important is is it for Gennady to break Bernard Hopkins' consecutive title defense record? Because currently he sits at 18, and the uh, the record is 20. Does, does he think about that at all? 
Um, you know, he's really focused on unifying the division. Whether he's able to break uh, Bernard's record, uh, that that's not really uh, his priority. He has a lot of respect for uh, for Bernard and what he's accomplished in the ring. Um, but uh, you know, just depending on what fights come up, um, that that wouldn't uh, that wouldn't be uh, you know at the top of his list. But certainly, it's something that he's aware of. I think he's got 17 defenses right now. I think this would be his 18th title defense. But um, you know, either way, he's getting close. And uh, um, you know, if he's able to break it, it's great. But uh, again, he, his priority really was just to unify the division. That way, he can say he's the undisputed. Uh, middleweight champ in the world. If there's no other champions out there, nobody can lay claim to his, you know, to his, to his throne. Well, I give him a lot of credit for uh, going into people's backyard, and I also give you a lot of credit for being able to pick up the phone and work with other promoters. Not not very many promoters are doing that these days, and I give you a lot of credit for, uh, you know, at least picking up the phone and possibly making fights happen. So uh, I applaud you for that. Um, but do you have any plans in the future, provided he's successful this year and what he wants to do, about possibly moving up to 168, or will he always be a middleweight? Well, getting back to your comment, I appreciate that, because a lot of people don't uh, don't really recognize that. And, and in today's, uh, uh, you know, age of boxing politics, you know, if I, if I ever excluded uh, a promoter from, uh, you know, doing business with them, it would just make that... M- that much smaller of a uh, of, uh, uh, pool of, of um, people that, uh, you know, as far as uh, fighters that would be able to get in the ring with, with Gennady. I, I, I recently uh, checked to see how many different countries he's fought in, and he's fought in seven different countries. So, you know, that's uh, that's just a statement of uh, or a testament to, to him really bringing back the, the true definition of a world champion. Um, you know, like Ali, you know, I mean, uh, you know, Ali was... Uh, recognized so much worldwide just because he fought everywhere and and um that's uh that's that's similar to where you know we want to take uh take gennady is just uh, getting the exposure uh internationally um his fights are now shown in over 100 countries worldwide and um um you know again just working with the different promoters is is uh that's uh i, I look at it as uh you know whatever's best for gennady in the ring and uh you, you know getting the the best uh, uh challenge in the ring regardless of which promotional company they're with that's always been our you know that's always been our focus absolutely yeah that can't be easy to work with uh work with all those different promoters man i tell you what that's got to be a nightmare um so let me ask you this where can we get tickets now i know tickets are selling out fast but where i know tickets are still available where can we get tickets for the fight um well, we we just this week added uh, additional floor seats um, because of the demand. Uh, the floor was sold out, and uh, we actually this would be the highest uh, number of uh, seats available on the floor uh, for any boxing match that's uh, that's taking place at at the Garden. So that that's a pretty big statement for for uh, Gennady. Uh, wow. You know, it's uh, they're available at uh, thegarden.com or uh, ticketmaster.com. Um, you know, Gennady's become one of those guys that just, uh, you know, he's become a big draw. I think people are, are recognizing uh, his talent level, and they, they they look at him as one of those special fighters where they want to see him live. You know, when he sold out uh, the Garden when he fought David Lemieux, he sold out the Forum when he fought Dominic Wade, and then, you know, the stories about the O2 Arena where the, the U.K. fans wanted to see him. He's kind of reaching that uh, kind of legendary status now where, you know, similar to Tyson, where people wanted to see Tyson, uh, regardless of how many rounds it went, they just wanted to see his explosiveness uh, in the ring. And that's, um, you know, that, that when you have a, a you know a, another, uh, or when you have uh, the two top middleweights fighting each other, um, that's that's what the fans have been uh, reacting to. Um, so that, we're, we're we're excited about that. And, and uh, any time you can sell out Madison Square Garden, the the energy in that arena is uh, is electric. Definitely, definitely. March 18th at Madison Square Garden. Tickets still available, but going fast. So go get them. Tom, it was great to have you on the show again. Thank you so much. And good luck to you Always on the 18th. Absolutely, okay, man. Thank you, guys. 
Thanks for listening to the Ringside Reporter Podcast. Check us out on the web at www.ringsidereporter.com. On Twitter at Ringside73. And like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash ringside73. Subscribe to us on iTunes. 